Here. Mayor Quintero. Here. And roll call for the authority. Authority members Draymond. Here. Friedman. Here. Mincy. Here. Brazio. Here. Quintero. Here. Weaver. Here. Chairman Najarian. Here. We have your report. Agenda for the December 15, 2009 joint public meeting of the Glendale City Council and the Glendale Housing Authority was posted on Thursday, December 11, 2009 on the Bolton Board outside City Hall. Before you today is the Director of Parks, Recreation, and Community Services regarding proposed Pacific Park Pool Development Project at 1A is Council Motion Approving Design development documents for the Pacific Park Pool Project and directing staff to proceed with the construction document phase of the project. Mr. Starburn. <coughs> yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll go to George Chapshin, Director of Community Services and Parks for the staff report. George. Thank you, Mr. Starbird. Uh, Mayor Quintero, members of the City Council, uh, uh, Chairman Nigerian. Um, as you recall, this is a follow-up item from the September 8th uh, City Council meeting uh, where you approved an L-shaped, six-lane L-shaped pool gave direction um, to staff and a consultant to uh, proceed with design development and come back with that design to uh, to you for approval. Um, staff is going to present a brief PowerPoint uh, with the design and some uh, renderings of the pool of the building as it relates to the site so to give you perspective of, of what it's going to look like. Um, in addition to that, we'd like approval for to move forward with the construction drawings. But in addition, in addition to that, I'd like to talk about um, some of the funding options for operations of that pool. Given that we have seen cuts in our department over the last two years, uh, we really don't have the money in our department um, to fund this um, operation. Um, so we've had some options. Once Dave, I'll ask Dave to come up and, and talk about the physical components of this project. Once he's done, I'd really like to talk about the operation side of it, um, what we think it would cost, and some possible <coughs> options to fund it um, while the during this, this bad economic times and waiting for times to get better. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I'll call Dave up, have him do the uh, the PowerPoint on the physical portion of this. Okay, Mayor Quintero, members of the Council and Housing Authority. Um, let's get our first slide up. <coughs> Here, just let me go. Back. Our first si slide gives you the overall site plan. In the second slide, you're looking uh, north. Uh, from Riverdale and Pacific <coughs> toward the proposed uh, new facility silhouetted in the background is the existing school and Pacific uh, Edison facility. Our next slide is, is a view looking s south from about rooftop level of the existing Pacific Edison facility. So you're looking down on the pool building down toward uh, Riverdale. And the next slide gives you a view looking northeast from, Riverda from Riverdale toward Pacific. Um, to your left is the existing playground and water play area, uh, then the pool, then the pool building. Um, we have some building elevations for you to look at. Uh, you're looking southerly from the basketball court plaza area toward the pool building in this view. And you'll note these are... are um, simply proposals on design materials and finishes. They're not final selections. Um, these colors and, and <coughs> scales are meant to be compatible to the existing Pacific Edison building, uh, and that's why that palette was chosen, <coughs> not finalized. And part of what will drive materials in this design is the LEEDS um, designation for the building and what type of materials need to be used. The next elevation gives you a view looking southwest from Pacific. Again, um, you get another perspective view of uh, that elevation. Next is the floor plan, and we've color-coded it with, with five designations for public space, restroom and shower areas, which includes the locker rooms, um, pool equipment, which is primarily maintenance, uh, office and staff area for the lifeguards, administration, and then storage of equipment and materials on site. So it's a it's about a 5,000 square foot building. The pool itself is almost 5,000 feet as well in, in size. Um, pretty simple building, um, functional layout, and um, 
that is really the design and the elevations of, uh, of this facility as, as they're proposed. Um, council has questions. We're happy to answer them. We have the design team here. We also have the architect and leads consultant here. And uh, our next step in this presentation would be to give you some details on the lead design elements of this project. Mr. Starber. Uh, Mr. Mayor. If you can, the the lifeguard tower stood out as I looked at the at the plot plan. This very page you have up here, mm -hmm. the largest room in the building. Uh, is it really expected? This is where the lifeguards will oversee the pool. If something happened. What, what happened to the to the less expensive aluminum towers that <laughs> you used to see <laughs> this beside is, the pool? Sure. This is on the second. It's it's pulled out from the building right. in this plan, but that's actually the second floor, so it overlays that. Uh, that par Is portion there some other of the function building. besides the lookout tower for the lifeguards? It's, it's really the roof and, and that lookout area. Um, but 620 it's, feet of building, though, on the second floor. Uh, um, how, I'm just thinking from a cost standpoint, how necessary is that? Sure, let me get the architect standpoint. up here and, 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 and talk about it. Part of it is the function of the roof. Uh, Jeremy Chow with WLC Architects. Um, the, the lifeguard tower has two two functions. Uh, one of them is we really want an, um, an element at the corner to anchor the, the aquatic center, and that's why we chose a two-story volume um, as the focal point of the project when you're looking at from the corner of Riverdale and Pacific. Yeah, so you can see it's a two-story it's a two-story volume that really, really uh, be becomes architectural becomes the focal point of that corner. Um, we're competing with a building that's fairly large to the north of us. Uh, we want really want to anchor this, the building at the site architectural. That's what we're doing. Functionally, it's uh, I I, uh, I, for I forgot which gentleman made the I raised the question. Uh, sorry, um, uh, point well taken. Um, the main point of that second second floor lookout area is we've had success in other aquatic centers our Fahrenheit design, where the staff really uh, appreciate is even higher vantage point to oversee the entire area. You can see we we even broke out the corner area for the with the box, so really uh, you can see out into the entire pool area if there's one staff up there overseeing the entire uh, the entire pool. Um, yes, we can pull we can pull it back a little bit. Uh, you will just become a, uh, a deck area, exposed deck area, so we, we don't have the air well, condition. Yeah, my question was though, it's it's 620 square feet of building. You know, a deck on the second floor, as observation, maybe with direct stairs going down, would seem to serve a purpose. It just seems to me to be a very expensive architectural element when you're enclosed when you're enclosing what is the largest room in the building for an observation deck. It's just a lot of expense, I would think. We. Uh, we're also anticipating that area to uh, act as a semi-storage area for any kind of uh, additional overflow equipment they might have to store in the building. Um, as far as the oh, the one the first floor, first level area, we dedicated most of the square foot footage to the public and also staff. We really don't have any storage area in the first floor. We have, I think, one storage room that's about 150, 20 square foot. So the, um, the site is tight is what you're saying. The site's very and tight. So we're trying to so, maximize storage. So in, what's the building costing per square foot, would you guess? We're estimating just the building itself, we estimate 400 square foot, but for the storage uh, pool equipment area, which is just basically slab of concrete and four walls, we estimate at 300 square foot. Right, but that's that's the equipment room. But what's the building construction cost? Three, four hundred dollars a square foot? That's what we're estimating. Four hundred dollars a square 400, foot. Four hundred. Four hundred. Okay, so this second floor addition is probably costing a quarter of a million dollars? Um, if you look at overall square footage, yes. But the second floor is really just four, four walls of gypsum board. There's no amenity on the second floor. Um, there's no plumbing fixture. There's no casework. It's just pretty much it's going to be used as a storage if area. If lifeguards see something happening, they go down in the interior of the building and then out to the pool? There will be PA system uh, attached to a building speaker system. So the ability for the lifeguard can hit uh, some kind of speaker system, and then the PA system will announce to um, to whoever that's uh, the life car wants to get attention from, uh, they'll be able to hear life. Yeah, I'm thinking of a life safety situation. Ignore the just the management of the activities of the pool. If there's a child that's having difficulty, right, 
Uh, we won't have one of the traditional lifeguard towers right beside the pool where they can, you know, go directly into the water. We will. We will. We will. You will have. So this we'll is an addition to that. In addition, right. Gabrielle can answer. She's the operations person. I'm Gabrielle Golia, supervisor of the sports programs. Um, we will have three to four standard lifeguard towers around the pool. We're looking to do portable towers so that they can be moved for various activities that are um, going on in the pool at any given time. Um, that tower area will be used for supervision of the lifeguards um, to make sure that they are supervising the water appropriately we can better monitor their activities we will also use it for additional eyes on the pool and for storage use Take a crack at this. Um, I was just talking with the architect and the I think one of the keys to this is that this is roof area and here it's shown in a two-story volume we could lower this and, and not have it. We would still have the roof area, and we would still have to build it. So the difference in, in design cost is really the parapet walls. You're, you're still going to have to cover that roof area. Uh, so it's not $400 a square foot because that includes slab and foundations and seismic. We're still going to have those costs. We're certainly adding cost by going taller. It's not $400 a square foot. I couldn't dissect it right now for you on the fly. But e e either way, I mean, we can well, take it out, but we're still going to have to build the roof. Hey, Mr. Mayor, you've answered my operational concern. I was concerned, yeah. on mm -hmm. one hand, that this is where the lifeguards are going to be. I think the last place we it's, want the lifeguards is watching the pool from inside the building. Sure. It's, it's one out. location it's, for them. One they, one have, they have multiple locations. I think we have two towers on the deck plus this and then the office where the windows are, are viewing the deck to supervise and operate the pool. Okay, well, let me start. Um, <clears throat> my first take on this in terms of the actual uh, building is that it's way, way, way too much. Okay. I, uh, I'm not worried about this building competing with the uh, larger school and auditorium and gym and so forth. I'm worried about spending too much money on this uh, structure. And so when I look, I see that the staff work area is about 415 square feet. I'm just thinking the staff doesn't need 415 square feet to uh, operate this uh, pool. I mean, that's a lot of square footage, uh, restrooms uh, for the staff, 111 square feet. Um, then the lifeguard tower, we've got it at uh, 600 and, or is it 820 square feet, whatever it is. 620. 620, yeah. Um, so there's just too much square footage. I mean, this is a park. We've already taken up a considerable amount of space with some of the other buildings. And so for me, we have to do just a modest... Uh, that's functional for the public, obviously. We want to have the showers and so forth, but um, I mean, it's just too much. I, I don't want to spend the money, quite frankly. I don't think it's necessary, and I think we can. I like the design. The design isn't bad, at least the first, the first blush. But these these heights, I don't think we uh, need to do that at all. Then I'm very happy that we've done the leads. Um, program and I definitely like the um, the solar uh, panels there I assume that's what they are they'll serve a dual uh, purpose and the general layout I think is uh, quite nice the pool is certainly a large size and it will absolutely uh, allow lots of activities to take place young kids neighborhood type of activities as well as as other uh, uh, more organized type of uh, activities but overall, I, I don't think we need to, to go quite this far, as far as I'm concerned. Um, anyone else? Well, I have a point of order. Did you want <coughs> comments about design before we move into issues of finance and money and sort of take it like that? I, I just have uh, two very small questions. The first is, in terms of lease certification, why, why silver and not gold? <coughs> What's the cost implications up front versus the operation cost down the road? Um, Eric Chastain, our jam design group, we're the um, a lead consultant on this. We actually hired a, a specialty lead consultant as well, and we have not determined any kind of certification level yet. 
what we're looking for is approval with design development, and then we'll have what's called a lead um, design charrette. We'll look at the possible points that we can get. Right now, we're seeing that we can get a silver rather easily. Gold is achievable. Um, if you're familiar with the lead system, a lot of times you can pick up points just by spending more money. So once we have that lead charrette, we will uh, earmark all the possible points that we can get right away and look at the possible points we could pick up. It'll be, it has been registered as a lead 2009 project, and yeah, I, I fully agree with you. We could shoot for gold. We could shoot for platinum. It's, if you're familiar with it, it all has to do with a lot of it has to do with money. Okay, spent. I, I got it. Thanks for the clarification. The staff report mentioned lead silver, so I'm glad to know that that's a starting point, possibly. Exactly. Um, secondly, uh, along with that, um, uh, I'm assuming then that we're considering non-chlorine options as well. Yes, we are sand filters. Okay, that, you don't have to get into an explanation of it. I, I was just just wondering. And then the last question, which is uh, more of a question for staff or for my colleagues, and you'll have to forgive me because this was all way down the road when I came to council, and this is really the first time it's come in front of me since I've been here. Was there a deter uh, does, uh, any thought as to replacing the current playground, or is the determination just that kids didn't need the playground anymore, there's other playgrounds in the area? Um, what was the discussion? Maybe you can fill me in as to as to, uh, to the thoughts about well, that. Yes, uh, my recollection was that uh, council wanted to keep the current playground. We had this project a little larger than it was. Uh, we scaled it down to keep the, the water play feature outside as well as the playground. Um, and the, the, the tan area you see is, is the current playground, the children's playground. But there is a playground where the pool's going. Um, no. Hot lot, isn't there? No. No? no. Not at all? We, so it's, it's the area next to it? Yes, we're working around it. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other comments at this point? Mr. Majarian. A couple of questions. <coughs> how, um, how wide are the lanes? Seven feet. Um, the, uh, the uh, lifeguard room... I mean, costs here, you know, obviously we, you're hearing from council as to costs being a one factor, but also leads uh, certification upgrade being another. Uh, I would like to see some options to that design and see if the savings are significant uh, in terms of eliminating that uh, enclosure uh, that we call the lifeguard tower mm -hmm. and uh, Perhaps the next step to LEEDS certification. Um, are we talking LEEDS certified or LEEDS? LEEDS certification. We're talking actual. It's a LEEDS project. Okay. Um, so I'd like to see those figures and see how they, they balance out. Okay, got it. Okay, anyone else? All right, net. Well, actually, uh, Mr. Chaikian uh, had his hand up first. Then Mr. Yeah, Starbuck. Maybe, I'll go right ahead. Let me just maybe call up uh, Gabrielle and the architect to talk about, a little bit about the space and what we absolutely have to have just based on code. Um, I know the building does seem, seem large, and we had issues with that too, and we had issues with how do you provide the adequate amount of space for both lifeguard, um, a room where uh, I think if something happens to someone, you have to bring them in. Yeah, if we can just go to that, so just explain why that space was configured the way it was, and can it be reduced, and by how much? Um, I would just walk uh, the council through the, uh, the floor plan real quick. So with a, with a reception area, it's one and two, and number two is where the, uh, the reception is, will sit behind the counter with the merchandise uh, wall essentially behind them. Once you go into the locker area, which is on the left-hand side, uh, those are code-required uh, you know, it's just completely ADA accessible. Uh, there's ADA showers, and there's also uh, shower stalls used as cha changing area. Uh, there, we, we meet the bare minimum uh, plumbing code um, as far as the required fixture. Uh, but with the addition of two family, um, we call them bathrooms slash change areas, we actually went above and beyond what the code requires. Um, when you come down to the staff area, the, it's Again, it's very bare bone in our opinion. Uh, you have your number nine is the first aid area, which you, you absolutely need just in case somebody gets hurt. There's an area for a curtain and a cot, and there's a sink, 
uh, there's a little workstation for any kind of uh, data entry and computer uh, software that we have uh, sitting on the desk over there. Uh, number eight is the it's actually the only office that we have uh, for for the uh, for the aquatic center with the copier uh, and the storage cabinet on the on the wall on the right hand side. Um, number five, number six, number seven. There are storage data uh, utility, uh, which is again the very minimum sizes that we would need for this place to be functional. Um, as far as you know, any kind of server size, the electrical room, um, and storage area. What is what is sixteen? Can you go through twelve, thirteen, okay. sixteen, seventeen? Oh yeah, uh, twelve, thirteen, and sixteen. There are there are uh, pool equipment area. There's uh, you can see all the doors open to the north. Uh, we want to facilitate the delivery of chemicals so they don't, they don't really have to go inside the park. So they can come from the north side directly into the rooms. Um, so that can be very easily by, done by city staff. They don't have to basically come into the park, to, uh, the aquatic pool area to do that. Uh, number 17 is the utility, uh, I'm sorry, the electrical room, which again over, opens to the north. So for any kind of maintenance, uh, it's very easily accessible from the park. They don't have to, again, they don't have to penetrate into the uh, aquatic in, aquatic area. Gabrielle, do you have anything to add? Sure. Let, let Gabrielle also. Um, I know that many of the concerns are about number three, the staff, um, the work room, and the size of that one, the, the 400 square feet. Um, that's the room that will be utilized. Um, we can have up to 15 staff on duty at any one time um, as far as teaching lessons, supervising recreational swim, uh, lap swim, all the multitude of programs that could be happening at any one time. And the lifeguards do need to take breaks. Um, we have to get them off the deck and into a climate controlled room. Studies have shown that their vigilance decreases greatly if we don't provide them with breaks every um, 45 minutes is about the max. They need to move every 15 minutes. Um, so that room will be utilized for the the break the mandatory breaks that we will require. Um, we also have staff that may be on duty for more than eight hours. They'll be required. We are, we're required to provide them with a lunch break, um, but they can't leave the area in case of an emergency. So that's the room that will be utilized for all of those breaks. Um, it's also the main room for headquarters. It will be the headquarters for all of our pool operations for the other three high school pools and our waiting pools. I have a question of, about the site plan. I don't know if you have a slide that shows the same site plan, site plan with the perimeter fence. Is that what I'm looking at in the packet? No, it would be back. Correction. Um, my question is, if I'm looking at it correctly and the perimeter fence is where it appears to be, um, it looks like there's a lot of space behind the building between the building and the fence. On the Pacific side? On the side between the building and the, uh, between the building and the Go to community. The first. Go to the site plan. There, there we go. It looks like there's a lot, on the, so on the, the north part, on the top part of the slide, why so much space between a fence and the building? Is that, is that, I, I'm just, I know that it's, it's not a big area, but I'm wondering why not, why what the fence wasn't moved closer to the building so that you'd have more space on the other side? That, that's not a fence. That's, that's not That's okay. just showing the, the, the uh, break between the plaza area that's being it. improved. Okay. We have to go back to that area to change the grade for water flow in that, but right, that's not wanted, a fence. Okay. Yeah, on that same question, if, I, if we get a perspective, how many feet from that line to the front of the existing entrance to our recreational facility? So how, how, oh. what will be the distance between the two buildings, essentially? Mm. No. The building, or the building. From from this building to the the recreation, recreation. Mm -hmm. entrance in the uh, Pacific Edison uh, facility, how many feet is that going to be? Because now it's kind of a huge expanse of concrete. But this would leave how yeah. many feet of plaza area between the two buildings? This what's the width of the building? This is this is the fountain right here. Water body from here to here. I might, I might add that these, do you see those two ghosted trees? You get to talk in the mic. Okay. Those two ghosted trees are the, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with the plaza, there are existing trees. Right. 
and those are actually one we're going to save, one we're going to remove. So that kind of tells you how much north we're, this whole thing's creeping up into the plaza area. We're kind of it's using this project as part of the green of the plaza. If, if you can kind of see that mm -hmm. uh, existing, there, there was concrete all the way to where the building is now. Right. And we've, we've crept up into the second row of trees up there to the north. It's so about it's much 75 closer. feet, I think. It's close to 75 feet. We can get you the exact number. Well, just, our, our best guess is it's, yeah. it's somewhere around 60 to 75 feet uh, between the two structures. Any other comments? <clears throat> All right, well, <clears throat> as I look at the uh, layout, the uh, first aid room is 168 square feet, and so that is uh, a separate uh, room. But uh, once again, the staff work area minimum of uh, 10 feet by 40, maybe even larger. The restroom is 10 by 10. I mean, that's an awful lot of square footage. And once again, for me, it's a park, and I want to try to preserve as much sort of open space as possible. So I think we could cut that back a little bit, and I'm sure the staff would be able to... Uh, to accommodate uh, themselves um, and the lifeguard tower, that whole thing, I, I'm not for that at all. I just don't see any any need to to do that. No other comments? Okay, go ahead with the presentation, Mr. Ahern. Okay, we're going to give you some information on the green building design and uh, then we'll go over, if, if you'd like to hear it, if if, so if if I could just get clarification, then uh, eliminate the, or you want to see fund um, cost options for the lifeguard tower, or just eliminate that? I Personally, I don't have any problem with the design as presented. I think it's nice. If, if it can be made smaller, that would be nice, too. My concerns are all about paying for this and financing it in the future, so I'd just as soon kind of get there than spend time dwelling on it. Okay. Mr. Draymond. Uh, I would like to see cost op options, yeah. Mr. Chapchin. Okay. For both mm -hmm. reducing... I, I like the design. However, um, part of how we're going to pay for it has to do with what the ultimate price tag is. And right. so um, uh, I also like the design. But I, even if it's even if it's some minimal number to put up the parapet walls and, and that those funds can go elsewhere, I still like to see that. So. Absolutely. We certainly can do that, Councilman Draymond. Um, just uh, this this project is being funded not out of general fund. We have CDBG funds for this uh, and some state grant money um, for this project. And this is anticipated to come within the $6 million price tag, but we, we certainly will provide the options for that. Okay. okay. Um, sounds like we want to skip the green design and go to the cost options for, for financing. Well, why don't you just give us a quick idea of what you have in mind. You don't have okay. to detail it, but just let us know what. Okay, let me bring our consultant up to. Yeah, there's just three slides, and they 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 will basically show you what we're looking at as far as points right now. Um, just bullet points of the possible points we're looking at. There's, as you can see, you just passed up. Oh, just passed up. The green. Yeah, the green. Okay. Um, the, just, just really quickly, it goes through the sustainable sites issues, the water efficiency issues, um, how we're going to get those points. It also touches on the energy and atmosphere, obviously, the Title 24 requirements, the photovoltaics, the solar, solar heating, and the building energy systems with the pool cover. And then also as we select the materials and, and colors and things like that, we'll, we'll be looking at options as well. And the same with the indoor environmental quality is more just um, commissioning and, and holding the contractor as he builds the project to the, the conditions. Okay, thank you. Does chlorine or not chlorine figure into this at all? Well, that's a sand filter. I'm just wondering if LEED, Leads. without getting into a whole big discussion over it, whether LEED recognizes that as being 
So that it's do they get points for not having chlorine? It, it's more of an energy. Yeah. Hello, my name is Nachi Madhavan. I'm with Jones and Madhavan. Uh, the Green Building Council really doesn't have any point system that is specifically related to swimming pools. So what we had to do is kind of take a lot of information from uh, electrical savings, gas savings, and things, and kind of apply that to it. But there really isn't anything specifically on the type of sanitation system that you use that you can gain points for. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, if you can just go back, maybe just the, the timeline. Yeah, let's just see the timeline again. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to talk about the timeline? So the timeline of, of doing the construction documents are not going to be hindered by part of the funding being frozen still? Um, actually, that's a that's a typo. It's a holdover from a prior report. That funding's been released by the state. So, um, so we're uh, with, with council direction, and it sounds like uh, you want us to bring you back another uh, design development drawing. But once we have that approval, then we can move to construction drawings, and, and that's about four months. Question, Mr. Weaver. How far in this schedule are we approving here today? Uh, today, you would be giving us the go-ahead to complete construction drawings. The first bullet, yeah. Construction drawings, then you would have to come back for Forbidding. bid and right. construction. Right. So this is this is the halfway step between concept and actually going into construction drawings. Do, will, will we plan with sort of mixed feedback here about size of building, will we plan on doing a, uh, a bid option? I, size of building? I think what we'll do is we'll work up some redesigns and bring it back, back again. Yeah, okay. before we go forward with construction drawings. Although we'd have to do it fairly quickly, yeah. maybe first part of January, yeah. so that we can make the June 1st, 2011 opening uh, for the summer. Sure. Our consultant wasn't busy at Christmas anyway, so he's happy to do it. <laughs> okay. okay uh, next slide, Peter. Uh, I guess just as important at this point is the operational side of it. Um, last time we were here, we talked about just the expense uh, to operate a pool. At a minimum, if we opened it from July 1st to September 1st, which is, which is a short summer operation, the budget would be $373,717. Uh, but an extended summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day is, as you can see, almost $550,000. Uh, revenue, when we looked at revenue, you know, there's, there's lessons and admi admission fees and that type of thing. We're really looking at, in the first column, probably fifty five to 65000 I know that the 109000 is on the high end. That's if we charge people more than 2 or $3 to get in. And I'm, I'm doubtful that we would be doing that unless, there, unless we design some fees for um, non-residents, which we probably will and come back to the council with. Uh, so at this point... Uh, as I stated before, the department currently is, is not budgeted for this operation. Um, in the past two years, we've reduced the budget, our budget by a million three uh, by eliminating positions. So uh, it would be really hard to pick that up with, within the current operation, uh, um, the Parks and Recreation Department operations. Uh, we would have to eliminate wholesale programs in our department to, to be able to do that, to pick up this operation. Um, there are some options for us, and, and Peter, if you'll go to the next. Um, what we'd like to look at is, is p possibly providing minimal operations initially for the first two or three years um, to fund the pool, to start you know, once, we, once we do build a pool. Uh, and part of that could come from a reprioritization of the CIP funds. We do have a million dollars in Maryland. Uh, we are anticipating, we are applying for state grants from Maryland Mini Park. Uh, Prop 84 funds that are available for a new park development. We think we stand a good chance of getting that. If that doesn't happen, there are there is the possibility of utilizing CDBG money um, in a pre-designated fund for Maryland and then shifting over um, CIP, the general fund CIP money, over to the operations over three years, maybe spread that out, uh, out over three years. Um, uh, we have looked for grants. There, you know, grant funding is very limited in terms of programming. It's very specific to certain types of programs. We do get money from LA84. We have been getting it for the past seven years. 
uh, seven or eight years. Uh, but it is, it's, it's really nominal compared to the operational costs. We get about eight to $10,000 a year average from LA-84. And uh, Mark Sturdivant has been looking for opportunities, <coughs> and there aren't a lot. He, he's been looking all over for uh, programmatic dollars, and they're really not out there. Uh, so we really, at this point, have to look internally in terms of how we fund the operations. Uh, again, it, it's not in our budget to fund the operations. So these are just options I'm throwing out and, and trying to get direction from City Council in terms of how you'd like to, to proceed. Quick Ms. Friedman. So I have a quick question in terms of um, you were talking about operation costs and employees. and at this, These fee structures for... Fee structure A, for instance, where people are paying fifty cents, a dollar, or two dollars to use the pool. Do you actually pay for the employee who has to take the money and the administrative costs that it that you're paying just to administer all those fees? Well, there is there's an employee up front uh, as people enter. Anyway, there has to be an employee there. It's that person that person is going to be collecting the, uh, the fees. And once you you collect the fees, then that gets deposited into the finance department. So there is an element of administrative cost to that. Uh, but having said that, in our current operations, we bring in about $80,000 in revenue for the three pools that we currently operate. So it, it, I think I know where you're going in terms of is it, is it cost effective to do this. Yes, it is. It is cost effective. On an average summer day, midweek, not weekend, about how many employees do you anticipate would be um, working at this? Boy, minimally, uh, maybe. Let me ask Gabrielle, who's our operations person, to come up and answer that. Um, with recreational swim, lap swim, uh, learn to swim lesson programs, uh, community swim team, community water polo, and a water aerobics and therapeutic class, we could have um, at least 15 at a time there. Um, and those staff, those 15, would be working shifts throughout the day. We might have a couple come in in the morning and work to open the pool and do lap swim and then leave, and a couple more would come in. So 15 all together throughout the day? Yes. But would, in a um, sense, be part-time employees, at least some of them would be? Yes. This pool would probably employ about 30 to 40 lifeguards. Um, 15 a day would be working at a time. And then how about the weekends? About the same number? Um, we have found that swimming lessons don't work as well on the weekends. Um, families, uh, they like the recreational swims, so we would probably have about um, six people on at a time on the weekends. Oh, so less, during the, uh, less on a weekend than during the week? Yes, the recreational swim time is not as staff intensive as lessons. Um, with lessons, we can offer up to six or seven classes at a time in that pool. Um, and so that's six to seven lifeguards in the water teaching a class, plus someone at the front taking people in, registering them, um, a supervisor, and the lifeguards who have to actually guard the water while we're teaching lessons. And the swim lessons and so forth, that type of activity is actually an enterprise that will uh, pay for the... Yes, uh, actually we made $50,000 off of that last year. So it will it will pay for the staff and then some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ms. Frangerian. I think the uh, looking at your fee structures, I think that they're rather uh, conservative, uh, both in the pricing and in the, uh, the amount of programming that is uh, potential to bring in revenues. Uh, that was intentional. We, we want to keep it conservative. Hopefully, you know, we'll bring in more money, but um, I, I'd rather go conservative than, than actually liberal on the, on the... I mean, I know the Rose Bowl, um, which is a much larger facility, uh, I think has a somewhat more aggressive pricing policy, and it, too, serves underprivileged and uh, uh, the community as well. So I'm not sure if there's whether you set the rates uh, and then, let's say, is CDBG funding permissible to help yes. subsidize a Learn to Swim program or a... Yeah, uh, and because this was funded in part by CDBG, we are limited in terms of what we can and cannot charge uh, for low-income residents. And I, I, we believe a majority of the, the people using this will be low-income residents, residents within the area. But we are limited based on, on CDBG guidelines. And we did check with Jess, and I. Um, I think that there will be, uh, you know, despite the surrounding census tracts, I think that you will also find uh, non-poverty level uh, residents 
uh, using this pool. Uh, seniors, I think, will will come out. So I don't really see too much in terms of uh, when we're talking about revenue for the uh, senior aerobics, uh, scuba classes. I don't see anything in here for local private swim teams renting the pool. Uh, oftentimes those rentals are at uh, non-revenue hours to the city, you know, 5 a.m. And I mean, there's people that get up at 5 a.m. to get to the pool to swim laps, as well as late in the evening, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. So I didn't see a lot of those in here, which uh, I'm sure your staff is familiar with, but in terms of painting a, a revenue picture, uh, it's good to be conservative, but I don't want to scare the those fiscally minded that this is such a black hole that we're that we're putting in here. There's there's many other types of programming events that that are possible. Renting the pool out for swim meets, for instance, um, high school meets, club meets, uh, kayaking, scuba diving, diving. I don't see any diving lessons here. So there's a lot. Of, I know that that's out there. You're you're familiar with it, I'm sure. Uh, that that would, I think, tip the uh, the revenue perhaps uh, significantly higher than your even your best cost, uh, your best revenue estimates here. So that's something that, that I know we can work on, and certainly is a function of how uh, how much uh, interest the community has in participating in these events, but. I think you know, we have to remember this is a perhaps we're dealing with a lot of pent up demand, uh, both from within the immediate neighborhood and throughout the city and perhaps the region for uh, use of a pool that we could uh, perhaps obtain some revenue streams from. Mrs. Yep. Starmer? Well, it's, it's <coughs> frankly all of that that makes me think that, that in reality we are never going to be satisfied with three months a year of this pool being available to the public. Uh, and I've been in communities with pools where when you have a youth group who comes in and says, you know, we can't afford or don't think we should have to pay your established rate, there is a lot of desire to want to meet that. And when the pools open, we have to pay the utilities in the building, the upkeep, the maintenance, and all of that that goes along, which is why the building, frankly, I'm a little concerned about the size of the building because that all in and of itself will require upkeep, utilities, maintenance, repair. And, and that is always more than, frankly, we ever estimated in any building we've built yet. I've yet to see us hit our estimates on what we think a new building is going to cost us to maintain. Uh, in that regard, in, in the estimate of other expenses, we have, for example, water, electricity, and gas estimate in uh, Exhibit 3B. That is for what period of time of operation? Uh, there was one provided for the summer only, and then one also provided for an extended <laughs> season. Uh -huh. Extended season is memorial to October 1st? Yes. yes. And then what would happen the rest of the year? Um, the rest of the year, the offices would remain open for um, potentially for any kind of private rentals, but the pool itself would not be heated and would not be... Okay, uh, maintained. But, but your estimates have anticipated the year-round cost of maintaining the building. Uh, I assume the pump and filtering equipment still goes all year long? Um, it would depend. Uh, we have two options. We could drain the pool at the end of the season, um, which would eliminate the option for rentals. Um, we will have to drain it periodically to do a maintenance on the plaster. Um, and Or we could keep it open and keep the pumps running, but we wouldn't be spending the same level on the chemical cost because we wouldn't have people in the water. But, uh, and given that this is our pool, um, we do have a lot more control over the rentals. We currently don't at the three pools that we use right now, and it's a very limited use, um, and we do see revenue there. Mm -hmm. um, so there are opportunities. Uh, it's just right now I'm not sure what they would be at this point, but you're right, there are, there are a number of items. You can have pool parties, <coughs> private pool parties. And that's been done in other areas. Uh, scuba diving, it is deep enough for scuba diving as well, and other programs that we're familiar with. My guess is with the facility there, and it'll be a very nice facility, uh, whether we do the, the tower or not, it'll be a nice facility. People are going to want to use it, and there'll be a lot of pressure to use the facility. My guess is it'll be unlikely that through any of the specialty activities, you'll be able to make up the entire incremental cost. So we're going to feel some cost pressures from this building. My guess is it would be very hard to stay to a $400,000 operating cost for the facility because people will want to use it. Mr. Drainan. I have two comments. Um, 
as, as, as often as we bring back designs and variations in the designs and variations upon those variations, we're going to have endless discussion about the, those designs and endless uh, uh, tinkering. But um, I, uh, the, the one uh, comment that was made earlier, I'm sorry, I can't remember where it came from. I, I assume it was in this, still in the same 24-hour period that we've been talking today. Um, there was a comment about uh, using part of the facility space as an office for the other three pools, so the, the school pools, or those the other three pools you were talking about? Yes, they are. So are there any efficiencies that we pick up there? I mean, in other words, how are those currently being handled? Uh, the staff person that currently oversees those is in the sports complex office. Um, we are overstaffed in that office, uh, more staff than we have computers at the moment. Um, so it is an efficiency in staffing time. But um, not monetarily. Okay. My only other comment is that uh, just to try to be uh, mindful, ask the staff to try to be mindful, and my, my colleagues to some degree as well, of the, the the key the key function here, a swimming pool for a community that is in need of of such a recreational facility, and is an extremely densely populated area. This is a getaway for families primarily, and I guarantee you that's the primary demand you're going to see here. So, to the extent that. Facilities that we might want or think are nice, or but but run the maintenance costs up. I think we have to just keep reminding ourselves. Cool. Thank you. I also have concern along those lines in the sense that this is in a low income uh, section of the uh, city, and so when we talk about these activities early in the morning type of activities, if we can make some money, that's great. But the idea of organized groups coming in and literally renting it and taking time away from just normal, and I, I see heads shaking right. back and forth, right? Well, that's how I feel also, that you know that's not what uh, it's about. But obviously there are times when I don't think, uh, although little kids get up early, I don't know, maybe parents would get them out the door at 7.30 or 8 and uh, bring them to the pool, but probably, uh, probably not. Anyway, that's where the function should be. Uh, I know you've gotten quite a bit of comments, and do you feel you have enough direction to go to next steps? Yeah, we do, and we'll come back. Do we need a motion to... Uh, well, I'm sorry, Jim. Mr. Starber? Well, the, uh, we, the we've, we've kind of talked around and about the whole issue of operating costs. Uh, what we have been looking at is usually with enough time, we can figure out a way to absorb additional costs for needed programs in the budget. Uh, this is an unusual time right now because we've been through two years of cutbacks, and it'll be a long time before we're even back to an even level from where we were three years ago. But our thinking has been to find a way to find capital money to have gone to some project and essentially pull it aside and keep it in a reserve to pay for the cost of running this program for at least three years beyond its opening so we can find a way to make it fit and over time absorb it into the general fund. We'll have, we'll have real operating costs. We'll know what it is. Uh, we'll know what it's costing us for the basic summer and the extended program if we go in that direction. But in all likelihood, we need to find about a million to a million two to tuck away so that when this project's done, we'll have at least three years to figure out how we're going to absorb the operating costs over time. Just so Otherwise, we don't have the resources. We, I mean, you'll open a new pool, and, and we'll be cutting back more staff to do it. I just want to be sure that there's no surprises along the way. You know, for instance, that we don't find that we've killed the Maryland Park to do this, or or that um, you know something else that people were looking forward to goes by the wayside uh, without us having a chance to respond and prioritize and, and give input. And that's my worry, uh, that I don't have a clear sense right now of what those projects are going to be. Well, if, uh, if, when you say capital improvement, I don't know if that means we had a plan to replace all the stop signs because they were fading a little, or whether <laughs> it means um, you know, no more bike lanes. I mean, I, I don't know what how draconian this gets. 
And I think for us right now, um, the only identifiable project that we have on the table is Maryland Mini Park that does have a million dollars in, in, in CIP from the general fund. We are applying for Prop 84 money. We think we stand a good chance of getting that because that's for that money is uh, the number one priority is uh, new parks in, in dense, low-income areas, and Maryland fits, the, the, fits it to a, a T. Um, short of that, if we don't get that, there is a possibility of using CDBG capital projects uh, funding, which the council has set aside a million and a half for park projects. And, and my goal would be by the time this comes back to you and you're ready to let it out for bids, we'll have an answer for that and, and all of the specifics attached to it. Very good. <coughs> All right, I have one speaker card, uh, Herbert Brown. <coughs> Mayor Quintero, <clears throat> members of the City Council, Housing Authority, and City Staff, my name is Herbert Molano. Uh, sometimes when I come to speak before you about projects or promote something for South Glendale, uh, first of all, I want to say that I don't want to sound unappreciative. I, I very much appreciate the effort to bring this thing to fruition, Mr. Najarian's effort and his interest to bring an aquatic facility, the rest of the council members in bringing the attention that South Glendale needs for recreational facilities, and uh, and I really uh, appreciate you coming, Mr. Draymond, with it, in that regard. Earlier uh, today, I had spoken about my feelings about the increases overall in the budget during the past 10 years. And this is a project that, when it's completed, will be about 10 years from the time that we lost the swimming pool. So this was a city that for 10 years would be without a municipally owned municipal aquatic facility. And I mentioned to you examples in Henderson, Nevada, population of about 240,000 with 10 recreational facilities, aquatic facilities. And so the decisions that you make, oftentimes I sit back here and I squirm at how long it takes and the multiple iterations that it goes through, months after months of changes, that to some extent, I, if we had set a deadline ahead of time to say we want to get this project done in three years and let's do all the decisions so you can complete it in three years. If it had been completed and thought about back in 2001 when the previous part was completed, we would have had a pool when the funds were good in 2005. But all these iterations of the process, and I think is what is so incredibly frustrating, the process of building a community swimming facility or aquatic facility that is desperately needed. And that's why I bring up all these issues about the quality of life indicators, about what is available to the community and how you take action to basically make it accessible. All these iterations possibly moved us right on through uh, the, the point where we actually don't have the funds. The other point I want to bring is that the decisions that you make concerning other funds in the city affected. In 2001, when you decided to make the change to increase by 20 percent the pensions of uh, safety personnel, there goes another $10, $15 million a year. When you decided in 2005 to increase by 25 percent the pension contributions towards the, the rest of the, of the uh, unions, there's another $10 million a year or so. So when you add it up, you're basically spending an additional $20 million at least per year just on the increased pensions. At some point in time, we've got to say, you know, if we make the objectives of fulfilling the needs of the community first, and then let's see what else is left over, and then figure out the patients at the end of the day, it changes the whole dynamics of this conversation. I sure hope that this thing doesn't extend beyond 10 years in 2001. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chapchin, you have your... Well, yeah, I think we have direction, and we'll come back uh, as quickly as we can in January so we can complete this and, and move forward. All right. Mr. Clerk, what's next? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We are adjourned for the city council. For housing? So moved. Second. Housing is adjourned as well.